Good morning, and the Lord be with you. My name is Pastor Mark Don. On behalf of, well, Pastor Joel's helping play the bass, and on behalf of the band and many, I want to welcome you here both in person and those of us who are joining us online as well. We know that we're having a little problem with our live stream, and that's why we've recorded this service, and we're getting it to you just as soon as we can. Hey, we are happy to have you guys joining us. Hopefully on the way in, you were able to get one of the announcement um, folders here. And I only want to highlight two things that are taking place the next couple weeks. One week from today, we're able to restart our middle discipleship hour thing. So our children's Sunday school, our groups, which we call our discipleship huddles here. And we're pretty excited. As the, as the huddles restart, we're doing a, a three-week Bible study and, and developing personal and family mission statements. I actually think that's going to be a pretty fun conversation and thing that if you're not already connected with one of those groups, there's a sign up in the lobby that you can do that and we'll connect you as well. Two weeks um, from this weekend then is when our youth group is helping host this trivia night and that's going to be pretty cool. Some of you have trivia knowledge that you just want to like put on display. Others of you are just going to come for the dessert. That's okay too. Um, so whether it's you or a table um, that you would like to have or be part of someone else's table or you want to say, I'm going to fill up a whole table, do grab one of these flyers. Um, and if you would return that next week, that'll help us better in the planning. With that, I just want to say, if you haven't already had a chance to fill out the connection folder, we'd sure appreciate it if you do that sometime early in the service, maybe right now, just to suggest that, that'd be cool too. But other than that, everything you need for the service will be projected on the screens, and we'd love for you to participate, sing, and join along. Beginning now, would you stand and join with me as we gather together in our opening song and our opening prayer? Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God who intercedes in the brokenness of this world and makes us whole, who intercedes in, in times of where sin is seen and you grant forgiveness. You, in fact, even come into the deadness of this world and you bring us back to life because you are the resurrection and the life. I pray that just as you have called us, have call, claimed us as your own in the waters of holy baptism, so that you would be present with us here and now. Bless our worship, bless our singing, and that the same word that the Holy Spirit has caused to be written might be understood in our hearts and minds now by that same Holy Spirit. For we pray this all in our baptismal name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing. Oh, Saturday was silent, and surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Oh, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. Oh, this is the praise makes a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Oh, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire, stirring something new. You're not going to run out of miracles anytime soon. Oh, resurrection power runs in my veins too. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. Oh, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. Oh, this is the praise thing to tell.
the garden What happens when God says to home I feel him moving and now I feel him doing it now I feel him doing it now Do it now, do it now Whoa! This is the sound of dry bones rattling Oh, this is the praise makes a dead man walk in Oh, I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Oh, I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Oh, I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Oh, I hear the sound. I hear the sound. seated then. Our reading for today comes from Luke chapter 6. If you kind of follow the, the um, historical way of talking about the church year, we're in a season called Epiphany. And it's a season that comes after Christmas. And it's, Epiphany essentially means the ahas, the oh. Uh, the readings say this is the Christ that was born. This is what he's like. And we've been doing it for a few weeks where we say the unexpected grace of Jesus and imagine you were one of the original hearers of this text. Nowadays, you and I have heard some of these. We're like, oh, yeah, we're not scandalized by it. But in a world where they say, an eye for an eye, when you hear things like, turn the other cheek, love your enemies, this would have been flat out astonishing, scandalous, radical, and all those things together. It's still a little bit radical and astonishing here today. Reading is from Luke chapter 6, speaking at verse 27. Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not, condemned and, do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This ends our reading. And so, you see what I say when I say, it wasn't probably only scandalous back then. It still sounds weird on your ears today. 
And so the question is, and that I would invite your time as we pray together our prayer of reflection, our God is unambiguous in this text. This is how he would shape you. These are imperatives. It's not like, hey, if you're thinking about it, do this. And so perhaps you would consider this, even as we have this moment of pause before we pray together our confession, where are ways that I have added to, joined with, and even multiplied the brokenness of this world, the punchbackness, the kind of thing that is fracturing us these days? And the only way that it's going to be interrupted is ultimately God's church going, there's another way stemming from a deeper source of the grace of my God. So with that moment of pause and reflection, would you stand and then join with me as we have our habit here at St. Paul of praying together a prayer of confession based upon God's word, knowing that our God stands ready, eager to announce his forgiveness. Will you join with me as we pray together? Most High Father, you are kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. I thank you for your mercy and ask that your forgiveness for all the ways that I am a part of the ungrateful and wicked. I have failed to extend to others the grace I have received from you. I am surrounded by your blessings, yet I am stingy with my kindness. For the ways in which I have blended in with a wicked world, forgive me. For the sake of Jesus' death and resurrection, Restore me to be called a child of the Most High. In Jesus' name, amen. For the sake of your Savior, for the sake of his death and resurrection, in your place, I, as your pastor, get to declare this is even more true than any sin you have just confessed. Your sin has been covered and you are, in fact, forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated then and join me as we sing together our next song. When I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself That I am now the man condemned for Jesus Christ is my defense. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. When my doubt and shame
of Jesus Christ, my righteousness. My sin is and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and risen Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From our text, this core verse is right there in the middle. Upon walking in what Jesus gives us to do, he says, then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Will you pray with me please? Merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that today through the hearing and preaching of your word that we might see all the more clearly Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, he as the embodiment of mercy and grace for us. And then seeing that clearly, Lord, I pray that we would be those who would escape the vitriol and vengeance of this world, that we would interrupt the cycle of returning equal for equal, eye for eye, and that instead, Lord, you would set us free to be those who extend your mercy and grace to others. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A first story. This is a lady by the name of Kia Sher, um, and that's her husband, Alan and her daughter, Naomi. In 2008, Alan and Naomi were by themselves on a bucket list trip to India. At that time, they were caught up in the midst of terrorist attacks that coordinated 12 coordinated attacks in Mumbai, claiming the lives of 164 people, including Alan and 13-year-old Naomi. In her own words, Kia has written about that time, and she wrote this. I'll read it. She said, I watched in horror as the news unfolded. In the hours that followed, I learned that everyone in our group had been accounted for, except Alan and Naomi, who were reported missing, last seen having a nice meal together at a restaurant. Over the course of two days, I was all over the place, and then I finally got the call, which I had begun to suspect and which I had been so dreading. It was from the U.S. consulate in Mumbai confirming that my husband and my daughter had both been killed. Are you sure, both of them? I kept asking it. Are you sure, both of them? I'd been desperately holding on to hope and just couldn't believe that neither had survived. Later, I learned that two of the terrorists had stormed the exact restaurant where they were. Everyone had dived for cover while the terrorists then proceeded to go from table, table, to table, shooting anyone in sight, and my Alan, my Naomi, did not survive that attack. My family all gathered around me in those days that followed, and we cried together. In total shock, we just stared at the aftermath of the attack on TV, trying to understand That's when I first saw the face of the lone surviving terrorist. He was a young man, about the same age as my son's. Seeing him there, the words of Christ came to me. Forgive them. They know not what they do. I said it out loud. Forgive them. They know not what they do. My family thought I had gone mad, but I explained, no, I mean it. Since love is lacking here, compassion is what we need. I got called by CNN asking if they could put out photos of Alan and Naomi. I agreed as long as they also gave this statement, 
and that was this. My commitment became to be the opposite of a terrorist, to love like an extremist. But I remained numb for a very long time. It was necessary. If I'd been able to feel right away, it would have shattered me. Not until some years after the attack was I able to feel the deepest part of my tears. Anger was present too, but what I experienced wasn't finger pointing or blame, which just leads to frustration and dead ends, but rather a passion born out of a compelling need to create something of meaning. Since that time, Kia has become an author, and she founded a worldwide organization towards fostering world peace. Another story. This is a lady by the name of Joan Scourfield. She was the mother to a 28-year-old uh, paramedic in training. Her son was James. In 2011, James had gone uh, to watch a cricket match in Nottingham, England. There, he was involved in an argument with a drunk man by the name of Jacob Dunn, who, through a single punch, blindsided him that ultimately ended up killing him, that one punch. In her own words, Joan says this, as soon as I got the call, I rushed to Nottingham to be by James' side. He didn't look injured. He just had one small bruise on his chin, but there was a bleed to his brain, and when surgery didn't work, he was put on life support. When he could no longer breathe for himself, there was no way forward, and after nine days, I consented that the machine should be turned off. But the moment I walked out of intensive care to tell the others that James had passed away, then everything changed because now the homicide team was there waiting for me. From then on, instead of being able to grieve and bury James, our focus got consumed by their investigation. I longed for my own space and to be with my family, but post-mortems followed, which meant that we couldn't have the funeral for another 11 weeks. It was its own kind of torture. 19-year-old Jacob Dunn was arrested soon after. It helped me tremendously that he pleaded guilty because it meant we wouldn't have to face a long, drawn-out trial. Jacob was sentenced to four years for manslaughter, but in the end, because of his age and because he had pleaded guilty, he only served 13 months. I felt incredibly angry and bitter about this. How could James' life be worth only 13 months? There was no, this was no deterrent to stop others. The short sentence just compounded my pain. It goes on after some time, she says, one day a volunteer came to us and told us about the British prison system's system of restorative justice. I had never heard of restorative justice, but they explained that if Jacob agreed, we could make contact with him through a third party to get some of our questions answered. Jacob was willing to take part. I wanted to know whether prison had achieved anything for him. We soon learned that there was no such system to help him change. Nothing had been done for him. He hadn't been offered any courses. He'd been released with nowhere to live. He was homeless, which I thought was crazy. What was going to end this cycle? Our back and forth mediation continued with him for some time. We learned that his friends had abandoned him. His family was completely detached, and he had no connections or support. Jacob, for his part, couldn't understand why we even cared about his life and why we wanted him to find a way forward. And with that, things did start to change. He got a job packing in a warehouse and started studying for his high school equivalency. She goes on to say their, comp their correspondence continued over the course of a couple of years. A year later, she says, we felt ready to meet him. The meeting took place in Suffolk. It was very hard. You don't know what you're going to say or how you're going to react. We arrived at the building and were taken into a room while Jacob was in a different room. I think it must have been the hardest thing for him to walk through the door and have to face us. I remembered him from the police mugshot but he looked so different in real life. He was a young man, not a monster. We were introduced by the facilitator and began to talk about what happened that night and why he had hit James. When I told him what James was like as a person, I saw Jacob's eyes fill up. We all shed more than a few tears. I could see he was deeply remorseful 
And that gave me hope that he could change. We agreed to build a future together by talking publicly about restorative justice and raising awareness of the catastrophic effects of even a single punch. I left the room that day feeling a little bit lighter, hopeful that Jacob would turn his life around. I've actually become quite fond of Jacob. I don't feel bitter anymore about the short sentence. I don't say that it's right, because, but I do think that we've done more for Jacob on the outside than prison ever did on the inside. We helped to give him a different outlook. People tell me they could never meet the person who killed their child, but I didn't set out to do any of this. What I set out to do was get the questions that were keeping me awake at night answered. It's taken a long time to feel comfortable with the word forgiveness. I used to feel that if I forgave Jacob, it meant that I'd forgotten James, but that's not the case. And now that Jacob is doing so well forgiving him, it's coming more naturally. Forgiveness for me means being at peace, letting go of bitterness, and letting Jacob into my life. Now let me say this, I know what my job as a pastor is. I've been doing it for some time. I know my job is to open God's word and say unequivocally, here's what God has said, and with all that I'm able to do, I know my job is to go, how can we apply and put this into play into our lives? And to be honest, I think I've already started doing that with this text. Because here's what our God has said, right? Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Here's what we know of our God. He would deal with us on the basis of mercy and grace. Mercy, not getting the consequence you would deserve, and grace, getting what you don't deserve. Mercy and grace. This is an otherworldly way of interaction. You could even say it's a supernatural way of reacting in this life because it's not what we see. Think about it with our national conversations right now. We have whole groups, we have whole political parties going, oh, I am keeping score. We are remembering what you did and we are going to teach you never to do this again. We have this internationally with countries going, uh-uh, we are never, we are counting the time when we can make this thing happen and we will let you know we mean business. It's, it's the logic of the world, still in Jesus' day, he summarized it as an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And the world goes darn straight. Yeah, that's what we do. They punch us, we punch back, and they will know we mean business. The problem of that, of course, is eventually you run out of eyes, and the whole world becomes a bit more blinded. Jesus goes on to say, with these things, he goes, what, what credit is to you if you act like that? Oh, or even these things. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? If you lend to those who you know are going to pay you back, what credit is that to you? I mean, it's fine. Be nice to those who are nice to you. This is a, not a bad way to go through life. But it's not particularly noble. It's an extension of, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. And let's be honest, that maybe works with those who are close to you, but you don't necessarily even have an unblemished record of that either. But Jesus is quite clear about this. He goes on and he says this clearly. I tell you, love who? Enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And because I happen to have worked with this, I translated this again this week, and I go, yep, that's exactly the case here. If you're a, a grammar nerd, this will mean something when I say they aren't the indicative form of the verb. These are all imperatives. There's nothing accidental or ambiguous about what our God gives us in this. If there's ambiguity, it's because it exists in me and in you. But remember this. The character by which God would deal with us is mercy and grace. The conduit by which he would deal with us. That pipeline is mercy and grace. And when you and I say, I will not be a part of mercy or grace, you are choking off that conduit, shutting it off from your end. Right? This is a truth we see in other parts of Scripture. We pray the Lord's Prayer regularly. Probably every time we gather here for church, we almost always have the Lord's Prayer, right? 
Here's what I want you to do. I just want you to say the one word where I leave off, right? You're going to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay, give daily bread, right? One word, forgive us our trespasses as. Now, you know what comes next, right? Right? Lord, I pray that you would, this is actually how it works. Forgive us our trespasses as, in the same way, just like we forgive those who trespass against us. Here's the truth. The walls of unforgiveness that spring up so naturally according to our sinful nature, I will never forgive them. All the things that you've thought in your hearts and minds and maybe said with your lips, those walls of unforgiveness that spring up, they end up snarling traffic both ways. In other words, the hardness of heart that keeps mercy from extending from you restricts mercy coming to you. And that is the prison from which our God says, I would set my people free even from that. And if you look around our world or if you look around this room, there's more than a little bit of subtle and sometimes not so subtle imprisonment in the world that is ungrace and unmercy. Ultimately, you know what? The only way that this text finds fulfillment, more than a, t- a to-do list or a wagging finger at me or you, what it is, is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me try to put it like this. Let's do this story. Pretend there's a person. It could be me. It could be you. It could be anybody. But there's this person, and God says, Boy, I want the best for them. And so God speaks forth creation for the sake of that person. He goes, he's speaking forth his creation. He goes, oh, they're going to love it. It is so good. And he speaks forth creation. And he goes, oh, this is going to be delightful for them. He goes, some of it is so grand, it's going to knock their socks off. But they can also look closely at this creation. And the intricacies are so beautiful that they, oh, they're going to love this. And then... He takes this person and goes, it's yours. This is for you. I did this for you. And you are marveling. You go, for me. You go, yes. And he says, I will honor you in this way. You, you have my authority. You are my image bearer in this creation. You get to care for it. You get to delight in it. You go, you trust me that much? Yes, it's for you, he says. Wait, wait, wait. Here's how it gets better. Here's how good things always get better. He's like, I'm going to join you with other people. We're going to multiply this joy. And not only that, you get to care for them, and they get to care for you. It's it's a beautiful plan. You get to go, I get to be a part of this. But of course, there's a fatal flaw in how this story goes. There's a, a, a scar that continues to affect that person to this day. And the fatal flaw is these, these persons end up saying, but I don't want to submit to his lordship. In fact, I kind of like the idea, I would like to be the boss of me. And he's going, ah, oh, but the, these, these persons, they just, uh, it's not good for them, but they want to have their own way. They want to have their own rules. They would even like to be their own God. And look at the mess that that's creating. And yet still, in the midst of that creation, our God still says, but you, we can interrupt the cycle. Love. Do good, bless, pray. Who? Everybody. Love, do good, bless, pray. And our God looks and says, but it's like, the, it's like they're hell-bent on perpetuating these fractures. It's almost like they can't stop themselves from punching back, and everybody's bruised, and everybody's blinded. There is more than a little bit of hurt and harm. In fact, you could call it carnage in this world. Some of it exists on a world stage, Right? You're tuning into the news, you go, I can't believe that stuff. And you want to go, that's what happens in a broken world. And God might look at us and go, it's almost like they enjoy and they revel in talking about how messed up other people are, either people who are huge on the world stage or people close to them. Man, why do they get such joy out of them? It's like they have the idea that says, if I'm not guilty of that person's sins, then I don't have to repent. Let's go, that just leads the carnage unresolved in their own lives they're still a part of the harm and the hurt, sometimes in incredibly personal ways. And someone might look and go, what a mess has happened from that beautiful creation. It's a tragic story. 
It, it's worthy of judgment. Ah, forget about it. It's not worth rescuing. And that's where the gospel of Jesus Christ comes in. He goes, I beg to differ. It is worth rescuing. They are always worth rescuing. That's my person. And he, he himself enters in. He, he enters himself into the storyline. Why? Because we're not doing very well at interrupting the cycle on our own. It's impossible. And when he enters himself into the storyline, the rich and the proud and the powerful, they don't have much time for him. They're too busy settling scores. But some do. And the some that do are those who are already broken, who are the outcasts, who go, I'm one of those sinners. And then you just read through the text. What does Jesus do? Blesses those who curse him. Praise for those who mistreat him, turns the other cheek, is stripped, is tormented, is crucified, and all of that innocently. That's just like our world. That's just like our world that visits their bloodlust, even upon Christ. But that's not ultimately what's being satisfied here. Jesus is involved in something far more, far than satisfying the bloodlust of this world. What he's ultimately doing is satisfying the justice of our Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father who goes, sin is not a part of my plan. I must stand against it. It will be dealt with. And then sends his son that says, I've got it. That's where our text ends up. Here's who your God is. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And when you are joined with him, you are joined with the reconciliation with our Heavenly Father and get to be a part of that reconciliation in this world in a way that you are part of greater miracles than you ever saw coming. None of these storylines that I started with was natural according to the ways of this world. But there is health and healing that you would not have authored if you even knew to do it. One last story. On February 12th of 1993, well, this lady's name is Mary Johnson. And on February 12th in 1993, her 20-year-old son was murdered. The perpetrator was a 16-year-old, O'Shea Israel, and O'Shea received a 25-year sentence for second-degree murder. In her own words, she writes this. I was at work that day when someone called and asked if my son had come home that night, and if not, I should probably try to get a hold of him. She said she didn't know if it was true, but she'd heard that his body was at the morgue. I was so confused and immediately called my sister, who herself called the police department. When she called me back, she said, Mary, they said they're coming to see you. Something might actually be true here. Mary says, I must have fainted because when I came round, my supervisor was holding me. I don't remember leaving the building or taking the short ride downtown, but by the time I arrived at my sister's house, they had identified the body. Three days later, I was told that they'd picked up 16 year -old, the 16-year-old boy who had taken his life. I believe hate set in then and there. Here was I, a Christian woman, full of hatred. I was pleased that he was going to be tried as an adult for first-degree murder. So when the judge suddenly changed the charge to second-degree murder, I was mad. In court, I viewed O'Shea as an animal, and the only thing that kept me going was to be able to give my victim impact statement. I was moved by my faith, so I ended off by saying I'd forgiven O'Shea, quote, because the Bible tells us to forgive. When O'Shea's mother gave her statement, she asked us to forgive him, and I thought I had, but I hadn't actually forgiven. The root of bitterness ran deep, anger had set in, and I hated everyone. I remained like this for years, driving everyone around me away. But then one day, I read this poem which talked about two mothers, one mother whose child had been murdered and the other mother whose child was the murderer. It was such a healing poem about all the commonality of pain, and it showed me my destiny. Suddenly, I had this vision of creating an organization to support not only mothers of murdered children, but also the mothers of children who had taken a life, and I knew I would never be able to deal with these mothers if I really hadn't forgiven O'Shea. 
So I didn't know how to do it at first, but I put in a request to the Department of Corrections to meet him. Never having been to a prison before, I was so scared when we got there, and I wanted to turn back. But when O'Shea came into the room, I shook hands with him and said, I don't know you, you don't know me, you didn't know my son and he didn't know you, so we need to lay off down a foundation and get to know one another. And we started talking. We talked for two hours that day, during which he admitted what he'd done. I could see how sorry he was and at the end of the meeting for the very first time. I was genuinely able to say that I forgave O'Shea. He couldn't believe how I could do this, and he asked if he could hug me. When he left the room, I bent over just saying, I've just hugged the man who murdered my son. Then as I got up, I felt something rising from the soles of my feet, leaving me. From that day on, I haven't felt hatred, animosity, or anger. That part was over. In March 2010, we gave O'Shea a welcome home party to the place where he would live, which was next door to me. And the party was organized by the organization that I had started and some Catholic nuns from the hood, even some ex-gang members from Chicago drove down to witness what was happening. When O'Shea told me that if I was willing, he would like us to share our story publicly, so that we could help others, I couldn't believe that he wanted to do this. But I'm pleased to say that now, he is my spiritual son. It's not easy for us to stand next to each other again and again and tell what happened that still hurts and share our story. But I say to other mothers that talking and sharing your story is the road to healing. And as we began, so we end. When our God says to us, then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds centered in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. continue our worship service with the virtual gathering of our offerings, which are done in baskets out in the lobby if you brought an offering or if you haven't had a chance to navigate to our app yet. Actually, in your connection card folders there, there's a little card called giving, and that'll tell you how to get to the app. The Church Center app is it's more than just how to give to the church. Uh, all of our worship service videos are in the app, uh, the announcement videos, the church directory. It is actually quite handy. So if you haven't had the chance yet to check that church center app, I do encourage that. Today we also will join our voices with Christians around the world in confessing our faith. Today we do so in the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We confess together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, your servant Joseph endured hardship and struggle, yet believed it would come to good. Give us such tested faith and bring all things to completion according to your purposes in Christ, the new Adam who has brought hope to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead all pastors, missionaries, and church workers in faithful service to your people with compassion and love. Bless every place where we hear your word and serve our neighbor in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help all parents who have brought their children to Christ in the waters of holy baptism, also to bring them to him faithfully in worship that he may continue to take them in his arms and bless them through his word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your love have its way with us, Lord. Teach us to expect no self-interested reward, but to love our enemies and to serve those in need. Put an end to all bitterness and strife. Let forgiveness reign between each of us even as Christ's blood covers our sins before your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold civil authority and those responsible to you for the welfare of our nation, state, and community. Help them steadfastly to pursue the cause of justice and protect life from beginning to natural end. Guard all first responders and protect those who defend us here or abroad. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort all who suffer, deliver the sick according to your will, and sustain by your grace those troubled in body or soul, especially Joe, Beverly, Sam, Ethel, Cheryl, Larry, Dale, Billy, Bradley, Dana, and all those we silently name before you. Give your comfort to those who grieve. Grant your children patience and courage to endure every time of trial with hope in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the gift of this blessed sacrament, O oh Lord. Give us a right heart as we prepare to eat and drink Christ's true body and blood, that by it we would be equipped to love you above all and our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you will bring all things to completion according to your order and time. When Christ comes and all the dead are raised, number us, we pray, among the saints in glory clothing the perishable with the imperishable, and bringing us into eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, as we celebrate Holy Communion, we welcome all those baptized believers who, who believe that they are sinful and are in need of God's grace and forgiveness, and who believe that in, with, and under the bread and the wine is the true body and blood of Jesus given to you for the forgiveness of your sins. If we have a young one among us who has not been tra uh, trained in the Holy Communion, we do invite you forward to receive a blessing as well.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this every time you drink of it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please rise and receive then the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite you then, as you're able, to remain standing as we sing together our last song. Though the tears may fall, my soul will rise, my soul will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my soul will rise, my soul will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. I cannot see you with my eyes, with faith the rise to you. When I cannot be your hand in mine, let faith the rise to you. Out of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, you shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. In your presence now. that I look around and I celebrate in this service is we have a couple of our middle schoolers taking prominent roles helping lead. Ella, is this your first time running the live stream all by yourself? Nice. <laughs> Eric, is this your first time doing a whole service? All three. All three songs. Hey, wonderful. Thank you for that. We kind of love it at St. Paul when we get to see our kids be who God made them to be in leaders now and into the future. Hey, good to be with you all. Um, if you're able to join us next Sunday for huddles when we restart that, just bring a Bible. Everything else we'll have for you. And if you're not already connected with a group, I'd love to be a part of that. Our children's Sunday school uh, also resumes next Sunday, and we're pretty pleased about that as well. God's peace then be with you all.
when sorrow comes my way you are a shield around me always you remain my courage in the fight i hear you call my name jesus i am coming walking on the waves reaching for your light the joy my strength in the darkness i'll dance in the shadows i'll sing the joy of the lord is my strength 